All right, let's try to finish up our analysis of the one part of this paper that we've been spending 11 lectures on, or 12, and that is our interpretation of the scalar curvature. Maybe we can finish it today. Um, we've gone through a lot, and the reason it's taken so many lectures is we've beaten back each and every issue, starting with uh, the very beginning, understanding how submanifold is related to a manifold, establishing that we have a relationship between the coordinates on the submanifold with the coordinates of the manifold. Then we talked about the pullback and the push forward, which was this expression here, um, where x is the coordinates on the manifold and theta were the coordinates on the submanifold. And this would give us a, an expression for the metric on the submanifold in terms of coordinates on, in terms of manifold coordinates, right? In terms of coordinates on the main manifold m, we're getting the metric on the submanifold Sn minus 1, right? And we kind of went through all the subtleties of that. And then we ended up with, uh, then we converted to Riemann normal coordinates, which was effectively taking our coordinates on the manifold M, which was Xa, and replacing it with lambda Va, right? That's essentially what this was saying. And uh, uh, Va is... Is, that's all the Riemann normal coordinate machinery, right? VA are tangent vectors located at the point P that identify the geodesic that captures the point Q. Lambda is the geodesic distance from P to Q, and VA uh, is the vector at P that's tangent to that geodesic that connects P and Q. And then lambda VA becomes our value of X. So we substitute now... Uh, everywhere we would see an XA, we would substitute a lambda VA because that's what Riemann coordinates, normal coordinates does. And uh, that's X, essentially what this expression right here says, by the way. Um, we argued a little bit about this term. Uh, when I say argued, I mean I argued with myself about it. Nobody, nobody came to my rescue on that one. Um, I did try to figure out uh, what, what, how I might have approached this one way or another, the bottom line is, is that I believe this term is zero in true Riemann normal coordinates. In coordinates that are sub-Riemann normal, meaning that these facts are true at P, but it is not necessarily true that uh, Q is on a geodesic uh, from P. You're not using the strict geodesic rule. Somehow the coordinate lines, um, the true geodesics might follow these line, this uh, red line here, and the actual coordinate lines of the system might follow the blue lines, and then with this difference, that's what this term would correct for. But if you're on real Riemann normal coordinates, this term is actually zero, and we talked about that in our last lecture. And ultimately, we went through all of this analysis, and we landed right here at the end of the last lecture. We now had a formula for the pullback of the metric, right? The, the metric that's on our fundamental space M is GAB, Right? And GAB is a function of the coordinates on the manifold, which are now given by V, right? VA. And so um, uh, given that, uh, uh, we now have a formula for the, the, uh, the metric, the value of the metric on the submanifold in terms of the coordinates on the manifold, right? And so it, we, you can kind of go through this item by item, right? GAB is GAB as a function of V, I shouldn't say VA, let me say V mu, right? The RAB, uh, the, the Riemann tensor, the fully covariant form, is also a function of the coordinates on the manifold. And these are known expressions, they're assumed to be known, meaning that the relationship between a coordinate on the submanifold, given the submanifold's coordinate system, two coordinates on the main manifold, that's a known formula, and you can take the derivative. Lambda is the size of the submanifold, the geodesic distance from P to the submanifold, and that's going to go to zero eventually, right? That's going to become really, really small. And, uh, and this is not an anti-commutator. We talked about that too. So that's how this expression works, and you end up with G uh, I J tilde as a function of V A. So remember, this is a tensor on the submanifold as a function of the coordinates on the manifold, which is exactly what we're expecting. Okay, and then if, then in addition to all of that, 
I also have my version of the same formula where I assume full power of Riemann normal coordinates. And um, so we're going to kind of work these in parallel. That's sort of the entertaining part of this work, right, is to show that these two methods uh, converge to the same answer. Okay, so that's where we're at. What is our next step? All right, so what's our next step? It's to do a change of coordinates. We are going to execute this coordinate change. And this is a coordinate change that's designed to simplify the problem. We've already sort of done one coordinate change. By going into Riemann normal coordinates, we simplified a lot of our work to get to here because we were able to set various derivatives equal to zero, various the connection at p equal to zero. So we're, we're constantly changing coordinates to be convenient, but we've got this expression. And what's important about this expression is that um, uh, uh, it, it uses these tensor quantities. So if we change coordinates again, this guy here is a tensor, right? So if we change coordinates again, uh, we'll still have a tensor. So changing coordinates is something we just do almost ad hoc. Now, this is going to be appear, appear to be a little bit out of the blue because the coordinate system we're going to pick, it's hard to see why it's motivated in the front end. And that's one of the difficulties of these proofs is the coordinate system change that we're going to talk about right here its value is not evident until much later. And so if you were to read this proof the first time, your, your head would spin. It's like, okay, why are we here? What are we doing? So you just have to take advantage of, or not advantage, you have to acknowledge that even the authors say, with a certain amount of foresight, let's do something. And just understand each step of what they're doing. And then as we understand each step, eventually it'll all come together. That's how a good mathematical proof is. It's like goes off into the wilds and then it comes back and it makes sense. And this is sort of going off into the wilds. Um, okay, so what is it? Well, we're going to now switch out of, well, we're going to change our Riemann normal coordinate system. So let me look at that for a moment. All right, so here we have our point P. I'm not going to label P. I'm just going to, this is our point P in the manifold from which our coordinate system is all centered. And you also remember that we have out here at some geodesic distance lambda, we have the surface of S n minus 1. And of course, the whole thing is the manifold M. Now, what we did is at the point P, we essentially said we went into the tangent space at P, and I'll kind of draw it this way. And we set up this orthonormal tetrad, which uh, I guess I would call E0, E1, and E2. And that orthonormal tetrad becomes the basis for the tangent space at the point P. Now, in my old work, what I would have done is I would have said, okay, here's the point P, and I would have pulled out the tangent space into a box, right? And then inside the box, I would have said, I have E0, E1, E2, and E3, and that's our basis vectors, right? Um, fine. Uh, I could do it both ways. I could kind of uh, just as an homage to all the different possibilities, I could erect this little thing here. The problem is, is we don't want this this E0, E1, and E2 to go too far in talking about a coordinate system on the manifold. It's just a coordinate system in the tangent space at the point P is the, is the way you need to think about it. On the other hand, um, why did we do that? Well, we did that so we could then pick out a point, a distance lambda away, right? Say this point is Q. And we want to follow some geodesic between P and Q. And almost always what I'll do is I'll draw a geodesic as some sort of curved line, right? Between G and Q, because we know that geodesics can be curved lines in certain coordinate systems, right? In Riemann normal coordinate systems, however, geodesics are actually straight lines, right? So the geodesic between P and Q would be given by a straight line. And what we know is that the coordinates of a point Q in Riemann normal coordinates is going to be given by this particular point Q, it'll be given by lambda because I have the way I've drawn Q is Q is on SN minus one. So the defining feature of SN minus one is that you're a geodesic distance lambda away. But the actual uh, coordinates of Q would be to, for me to take this geodesic curve that connects P and Q, 
find the tangent vector of that curve at P, right? And that tangent vector we could call, say, say we called it V alpha E alpha. Now notice that's a vector, right? That's an element of this space, V alpha E alpha. It's written in this basis E, uh, the, uh, the basis of the tangent space. Let me get this box out of here. And that's a legitimate vector. And as such, it is tangent to some geodesic, right? So there is a vector here that there is a curve that when I take the derivative of that curve, I get this vector. So say that curve was, let's go all the way back. Say that geodesic curve was a gamma mu sub lambda, where lambda is the parameter. Then I know that uh, the vector, the tangent vector of, of that curve is given by partial gamma mu partial lambda and then uh, use then the uh, uh, appropriate basis vectors which in the way we've done this work before have always been coordinate basis vectors but in this case what we do is we're going to replace these basis vectors we're, 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 this would be in the coordinate basis system but now we're working in the tetrad basis system so now we refer to it re re refer to it into the tetrad basis. And if there's some grand coordinate system on M, then each tetrad basis vector is actually given as a vector in the coordinate basis of the grand coordinate system on M. That all goes kind of back to our lecture on the tetrad basis. But right now we're talking about a tetrad basis and the key is that these are orthonormal vectors. And when we say they're orthonormal, they're always orthonormal relative to the metric on M. That's why we can talk about orthonormality. The point is, is we end up with this guy, right? All right. So uh, let me erase these brown things. Okay, so now we have this basis vector. Uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. We have the tangent vector V lambda E lambda. I'm just going to call that uh, V alpha, not lambda, V alpha. We're going to call it V alpha. We're going to get rid of the actual explicit statement of basis. And the coordinates of the point Q are, is go, are going to be lambda, V0, V1, V2, V3. Now, this may seem like there's too many degrees of freedom because you have lambda and then f these four numbers. But this is orthonormal, right? So you lose a degree of freedom because of the orthonormality restriction. So it really is only three co three. Uh, I'm sorry, four basis vectors. There's four degrees of freedom here. So these numbers here are all reflect the uh, components of the tangent vector, the components of the tangent vector uh, in this tetrad basis, right? That's what, what that's what these numbers reflect. So if you if this was so you could literally project these and you would get you would get, uh, this would be V2 right here. I guess I could blow this up. This would be V1 right here. This would be V0. And then of course there would be a V3 that's a, the fourth dimensional version of it, all right? So that's what we mean by this V. Okay, so the way I've drawn it is very nice because I've used essentially a Cartesian, right? I've used a Cartesian orthonormal system here, right? So VA is sitting in this Cartesian orthonormal system. The point Q is in Riemann normal coordinates identified this way. And every point along this line is on the geodesic that connects P and Q, right? I'm now in this Riemann normal coordinate system in M, right? M has, the way I've drawn this on the screen, right? This screen is now in Riemann normal coordinates, all centered at the point P. So every point, Every point on this uh, screen, like that point there, there's a geodesic that connects P, the, our, our center point, with that point. And that geodesic is this one. And the distance for that is some other number, le uh, evidently not lambda, right? Because I guess all the points that are lambda away are, are in blue, right? Right. So this is some smaller number. And that point has, uh, so this and this uh particular geodesic, has its own tangent vector. And notice the tangent vectors are going to lie right on these lines as long as you're in Riemann normal coordinates. And that, so this point is going to be some other thing like epsilon. And if its 
tangent vector is not v but w, it'll be w0, w1, w2, w3. And likewise, every point on this geodesic will have, say, lambda over, uh, say, lambda over 2, v0, v1, v2, v3, where these numbers and these numbers are the same because they're on the same geodesic, it's only the geodesic distance that's different, right? Okay, so with that in mind, now that this is the setup, this is what the x-coordinate system is. The x-coordinate system on M is Riemann normal coordinate. So I can say x alpha equals some number lambda v alpha, right? Where v is the tangent vector of, of whatever uh, geodesic connects uh, the point referred to by x alpha to p. So x alpha is the coordinates of some point in M, and we're going to give that as a parameter distance times a tangent vector. And if that parameter distance is exactly lambda, then we're going to say that that point is on Sn minus 1. But that parameter distance could be anything, right? So maybe in full generality, I should write it's epsilon. And just to make sure, because I've been talking about v so much as uh, the direction to this particular point q on Sn minus 1, I could, in fact, call this just tangent of the geodesic alpha, right? So this is basically how any point's coordinates are written in, uh, in Riemann normal coordinates. And in fact, if I wanted to really get it super clear, I would say the coordinates of some point, uh, some point uh, S, right, where S is literally a point in the manifold, the coordinates of a point S is epsilon times the tangent vector of the geodesic that contains S, something like that, right? There's a lot of ways of looking at this, and the reason I go over it over it again more and more is because it's actually kind of important. But everything does depend on our choice of this basis, which I've chosen to be, and I've depicted it as uh, a essentially a Cartesian basis at the point P, E0, E2, and E1. And that's the key to understanding this next step of the proof. We're actually going to make a basis transformation here to something more convenient for the analysis. And that's effectively changing the coordinate system or the coordinates of the vector space at the point P, which changes the way these tangent vectors are written. They're no longer going to be V alpha, E alpha like this. Now they're going to be some other thing, V alpha prime, a coordinate system change to E alpha prime. We're going to change from the unprime to the prime system. And we're doing that to affect a simplification of the proof, right? So what we're going to do is, uh, so let me erase this and explain exactly how that basis transformation is going to work. All right, so my proposed change is that instead of this coordinate system, we're now going to take a new coordinate system. We're going to say x, x prime of s, and it's going to equal the radial distance along uh, the, the radial geodesic distance will still be will actually be the first coordinate, and the other coordinates are going to be theta one, theta two, and theta three, and we're going to call them angular coordinates. And this is basically going to be an angular spherical coordinate system. So we're going to convert from this Cartesian coordinate system to this angular spherical coordinate system, which is really just a coordinate transformation. It's, it's, we're not going to articulate it in precise detail except to say that the relationships are that as you change these angular variables, you don't change this first one, and that's going to be the crux of the matter. We're trying to uh, simplify the structure of the metric using this angular coordinate system. But we're going to affect uh, a basis transformation, and I guess I should write this as x alpha prime, right? x alpha prime. So the prime system, the way we talked about it, is going to be this spherical system. So normally, when we talk about coordinate transformations, what kind of equations do we write down when we, when we were generally learning about the general coordinate transformation? What kind of equations did we write down, and how did we understand them? But well, we always understood that there would be two systems, the prime system and the unprime system. And sometimes we say the old coordinates and the new coordinates. 
And this top equation would say the prime coordinates are a function of the unprime coordinates. So if I know the unprime coordinates, I make a coordinate change to the prime coordinates and I use these formulas, right? That's what this form is supposed to be. Likewise, I could say the unprime coordinates are functions of the prime coordinates. And I could say that the new coordinates are a function of the old coordinates and the old coordinates are a function of the new coordinates. A lot of different languages available out there. But then when I talked about given this change of coordinates, which is totally arbitrary, right? There's no rules about what these things could be, except that you really do need them to be invertible. But other than that, um, you know, these can be totally massively nonlinear and complicated and bizarre. But when once you have this, you know how to take anything that is a tensor and transform it, and we use the following formulas for that. I would write down this thing. I would say that the tensor in the old coordinate system multiplied by these two partial derivative structures and summed into them, notice this is an Einstein sum, so this is a long sum of expressions, gives me an expression for the tensor in the new coordinate system. Right, so this is this is how uh, I would normally write these things. I'm using A and B. I would normally use Greek letters, but you know the book is clearly using A and B. Now I'm using a system where I take the uh, I take the uh, uh, superscript or or likewise the subscript, and I throw a prime on it. So I have primed subscripts and primed superscripts. So it's sort of superscripting a superscript, which is kind of annoying to write, but it looks good in print. And it is the way I do it. It's very simple for me to say the A is the old system, the A prime is the new, or the unprimed and the prime system. There's so many different conventions out there. And obviously, this paper doesn't do the same thing. You'll see here, they, they use a different system. But this is how I taught it, and I want to make the full connection. So now, once I've decided about this coordinate change, right, then X A prime is x a prime x zero prime is the radial distance or the geodesic distance x one prime is this first angular variable x two prime is this second angular variable and x three prime is this third angular variable right now the way the paper will say it is the paper says okay we're going to call this geodesic distance lambda and lambda could be different right no, no matter what lambda is Whatever it is, all the points lambda away are on s minus 1. So as we shrink lambda to 0, s minus 1 collapses to a small hypersurface around p. And that ultimately is what we're going to do. We're going to shrink lambda down. So lambda is uh, just the geodesic distance, and then you have these three angular variables. And this becomes the coordinate system as opposed to what would be, uh, 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 in the other notation, what would be this here, what would be uh, lambda, in the old notation, be lambda v0, lambda v1, lambda v2, and lambda v3, right? That would be the old system, and this is now the new system, right? And the metric, once I know these formulas, I take these derivatives, and I get the new metric in terms of the old metric. And that's exactly what these equations are. These equations are nothing more than expression of exactly this, where instead of g a prime b prime, like I've always done, he says, no, no, we're going to signify the new metric just with a capital G, and we'll just use the same letters, a, b, right? We'll just use the same letters. And the distinction is in the structure of g. So these indices are on a different object. And so this is the the metric in the new coordinate system. This is the metric on the old coordinate system. Notice this has nothing to do with the pullback metric, right? The pullback metric was g tilde, and that is a metric that exists on this separate manifold, right? And what we remember is, funny thing, the, the metric on this manifold s was also called theta, remember? Let me uh, show you that page. Way back in the beginning of the paper, we talked about a map from the submanifold to the manifold. The coordinates on the submanifold were called theta, and the coordinates on the new manifold were, or, or on the main manifold were called xa. And we all knew that xa, the, the coordinates of all the points on this manifold were given by these functions xa of theta, right? So the functions of the coordinates 
the functions of the coordinates on the submanifold gave you coordinates on this manifold. That's not the old new coordinates, right? That's a subset of this manifold. It has its own coordinate system because it's a manifold in its own right. This is the command of, this is the way you learn what are the coordinates of this subset in the main manifold given the coordinates on the subset. And the coordinates on that subset were called theta. And they did that for a reason because this moment in time was inevitable to them because they had foresight. And when they wrote their paper, oops, they knew when they wrote their paper, they knew that this change was coming. And now if you think of it, if you freeze lambda and you just think about these three coordinates, every single point on Sn minus one is given by these three coordinates, right? Remember, Sn minus one is one dimension less, N minus one. It's one dimension less than the dimensionality of M because the dimensionality of the main manifold is N, right? So, so when we make this change of coordinates from here to here, we also get for free a set of coordinates just on Sn minus one. Now that was true before, by the way. These numbers here, right? These, uh, uh, this tangent vector, right? Obviously projected to the surface, every point on the surface, uh, Sn minus one can be associated with a single tangent vector at the point P. So it's always true that you can create a coordinate system on Sn minus one just based on a piece of the coordinate system for M in Riemann normal coordinates. So, but now we're going to go ahead full out and say we are going to literally use these numbers as our coordinate system on Sn minus one. We're not going to use them yet though. Right now we're just worried about converting uh, the metric on M, which is a metric all throughout M, into a new metric on M that, uh, well, it's not even a new metric. It's the same metric, just expressed in different coordinates. Okay, so the way they, so now, um, the way they did is they stick with A, B, and um, uh, so now uh, that that's how these guys are gone, but, but I haven't fixed the, these two ones, right? These are still with with primes, right? So they have to match this. So if I literally did that, if I literally did that, this would be an impossible thing to understand because it would literally look like this, right? The lower indices here end up there and they're the same as the upper indices here. Now, in principle, this really, really is not a problem because you know that this A matches that A upper and lower and that has to be summed over. So you kind of know those have to be summed over, leaving those behind. So there actually is a way to, to distinguish these things if you rigorously obey the Einstein convention. In other words, you, this A, you know is a dummy index because it has an up-down relationship with that A. This A has an up-down relationship with nothing, although I suppose you could think of it this way, but there's, that's not a logical up-down relationship, right? This is a derivative. So anyway, um, but this is a mess. I would never do this, right? So, but what I can do is I can rename these guys, right? This was A prime and B prime. Well, I know that um, uh, X, a, a, when A prime is zero, um, X A prime is actually lambda. So what I would write is I would write G zero, zero is D X A partial lambda, I keep saying D, but I mean de partial, partial X B partial lambda G A B. And now I'm completely clear, right? The denominators are unambiguous, They're, the numerators are unambiguous, but I'm only calculating one of all the different G A Bs, right? So, you know, in principle, I guess I, sh I just to be clean, I should leave those as G prime, A prime, B prime. Now I'm double redundant, right? I have two ways of indicating that G is in the new system. First of all, I've capitalized it. And second of all, I've still got the primes. But if I want to get rid of the primes, I can still break it down by number. And so G00 is given by this expression here. Um, and this is something I can calculate because presumably I know this coordinate transformation. And this is something I can calculate because I know this coordinate transformation. And in fact, uh, I can do it explicitly, which I will in a minute. But I just need to clear up one more thing. 
notice that I have this as G00, and they have it as G11, right? And so they're, in the paper, they're going from, they're doing the indices 1, 2, 3, and 4, whereas I'm using the indices 0, 1, 2, and 3. But so we want to be like the paper, right? The paper is our guide here. So uh, we will uh, change that to 1, 1. So I'm kind of, what the whole point of this is I'm walking you through, if you'd been following the lectures, the kind of the notation we've used in the past, and I'm getting you to the literal notation they're using in the paper. And the reason I'm doing this in such a belabored way is because this is your life if you read this stuff. Your life is constantly refiguring out how people write stuff down and matching it to the bizarre and unpredictable way you learned it, right? Because there's a million ways to learn it. And then, but when, if you want to learn something new or you want to read a new paper, you're stuck with their way. So you've always got to kind of do this translation in your head about the notation. And to me, look, that's, I, I, I actually kind of enjoy that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Call me crazy. But um, it, it's, it's kind of one of the things I like to do. And so my lectures are going to reflect that. Okay, so now we've figured out what this G11 is. Now, the others are pretty obvious, right? G1C is, well, the, the, the first index of this is going to be 1, which is um, the lambda coordinate. So that's going to be dxa d lambda. And the second one, uh, we're going to leave it as C. It could either be 1, 2, or 3. And we're going to leave that with the number C. So C goes between what I would call 1, 2, or 3. But um, what they're likely to call is 2, 3, and 4, right? Two, three, and four, because because if C was ever one, you'd end up with G one one, which we've already covered. So C must be two, three, and four, and that C could be two, three, or four. It's and the angular coordinates are very much the same, right? They're the same, and uh, they have the same properties. The radial coordinate is definitely different. We're going to use that difference in a moment, and then of course there's G C D, where the first one is two, three, or four, and the second index is two three or four, and that's given by this expression here. So that's how, that's what this all means. So with that in mind, um, can we make any progress, right? This is basically, I mean, it's, it's almost child's play in the sense that it's literally a, a straightforward application of the symbolic process of going from the metric in the manifold to the met, uh, in one coordinate system to another. This is the classic transformation of tensor components, right? Notice we've dropped all pretense of a basis here, right? I'm no longer um, carrying around these basis vectors of the tensors, right? I'm not, for example, I'm not doing G, A, B, um, uh, what would this be? This would be a D, X, A tensor product, D, X, B. I'm not carrying around this basis vector, right? Um, uh, we all, you should all understand where those basis vectors sit in this world, but I'm not going to carry them around because it's almost never done in any reasonable papers on the subject. So we're talking about the transformation of the components of the tensor, and that's what this is. And all we've done kind of is rename these things. But remember, we are saying these are spherical, so we're, that's going to come into play at some point. And um, uh, we also know that the original coordinate system is given... Um, by by this formula. And by this formula, what I should do is I should write it back in the way that we know it to be, which is lambda v a, right? Lambda v a. And that's important because that lambda is the same lambda as this. This lambda um, comes out and it's, it's, it's a coefficient of every one of the components of the tangent vector to the relevant geodesic. And because of that, Every time I see dxa d lambda, what can I do? Well, I can write it down. Let me erase some stuff. Uh, let's see. There, I've erased some stuff. I moved our, our transformation thing down here. Um, you know, this is bothering me. I'm going to change that capital G back to this small g just for kicks. We understand how the translation works now. We understand that this formula here is what we applied to generate this, and they're just using different notation and a different counting system, right? But once that's done, uh, anytime I see this guy, right, anytime I see dxa d lambda, well, I know x, xa is lambda va, so 
dxa partial dx, xa partial lambda is going to equal va, right? So I know right away that this is va and this is vb. Oh, God, I should change that to... Uh, I should change that to red, right? This is VA and this is VB, right? And those go away. So that's good. And I know that this is VA, right? But I can't do much else, um, right? I, I can't uh, simplify it any further. But we do simplify G11 a lot. We do simplify G1C a little bit. And we don't simplify GCD. But anyway, so knowing this, at least one of those derivatives is known to us. Oops, there's an A there. So now let's go back to the paper and see how they, so, so, okay, so two things before we go back to the paper, um, just to point out is one, we've made this coordinate change. Two, notice that the coordinates on the manifold itself, Sn minus one, the submanifold, we're going to call that coordinate system the same thetas, right, the same thetas. We define it for some value lambda, but that's not counts as a coordinate because Every single point on the manifold has the same number. So it doesn't distinguish any point. It, knowing lambda doesn't really help distinguish uh, any point on the manifold from each other. It does distinguish the manifold. For example, there's another manifold right here, right, with, you know, that isn't lambda. Maybe it's lambda over, uh, maybe it's two-thirds lambda, right? It's not quite as far out. But every point on this manifold, again, this number doesn't distinguish oh, with all these messy lines. Hold on a second. Let me let me make this a little bit better. So what I'll do is I'll I'll boost the size of the thickness, right? So here's that's the other manifold where where uh, lambda it's say it's uh, three fourths lambda is the distance. So every single point on this manifold has three fourths lambda as its radial coordinate. So, it, so that radial coordinate doesn't distinguish these points from one another. The only thing that distinguishes the points from one another are these three numbers here. Likewise, in the old coordinate system, the same thing applied. Lambda was shared by every single point on the manifold, on the blue manifold, but each one had a different collection of, of, um, of, of, of vector components that identified the tangent vector of the G, DZ. Okay? All right. So... Uh, so what we've done is we've not only done a coordinate change on this tetrad basis system or on this on this basis system down here. We've changed the coordinates from Riemann normal coordinates to these sort of spherical coordinates. What we're also doing is we are um, choosing a coordinate system for the manifold itself. And that coordinate system is just these three thetas, which, of course, exactly matches the theta that we used in the beginning. So they kind of anticipated this. They anticipated that that theta would, would appear, and now it's appeared. Okay, so let's go back to the paper and see how they moved from this point on. So this is the part of the paper where we were just at. Let me erase some stuff here. And here's this is the part that I clipped and we showed. And I made this substitution already, right? I used, that's V, oops, this is way too big now. So I made this substitution VA and VB here, which is what they did. And then what they noted is, well, wait a minute, VA and VB, those are uh, components of the, uh, orth the normalized tangent vector that describes the location of the point. Remember, we have lambda, V0, V1, V2, V3. This is normalized, right? That's normalized. And... Uh, uh, they're the components of some orthonormal frame, in other words, V, A, E, A, but V, A, but these are all meant to be normalized. Ergo, this, right, this full expression, which reduces to this expression, is always equal to 1. So that's one of the beautiful reasons for choosing this system, is you can definitely say that this first component, this upper left component, is always just going to be 1, which is really cool. Okay, what about the next one though? Let me uh, let me erase erase this. Well, the next one it's sort of similar, right? This here becomes V A because remember X because we have the principle that X A is lambda V A. 
Um, this one here, which I said before we couldn't simplify, that's actually not true, right? Because if xA is lambda a, lambda is a constant, so the constant comes out. So this becomes partial v b partial theta c, which is what they've done here. They've replaced the x with v, and they pulled out the lambda. So that's pretty cool. And so now they study this guy. And there's two ways to look at that guy. Let me uh, erase this mess. But there's two ways to look at, at this piece right here. The first way is to say, well, this is an orthonormal system. So because it's an orthonormal system, the, this is the magnitude between a vector and uh, uh, a change in that vector. And because it's orthonormal, it must be that, uh, that zero. A better, a little easier way to see that if, if, if that logic in itself doesn't just strike you straight up is to realize that this is a piece of this, right? Well, this is literally equal to this expression right here, which is the, uh, the theta derivative of the magnitude of v, the, of v, right? A v contracted essentially with itself. When I say V contracted with itself, V A V B is what, what I mean. And of course, this lowers B, right? That lowers B. So, but we know that this is a constant because it's an orthonormal system. So this becomes the derivative of a constant, which is zero. So that means that every, every matrix element that be, that whose first index is one is going to have a value of zero which is amazing. So that means that that means that all of these guys are zero. Now notice they don't have just four slots. In our world, there's only four slots because we're doing general relativity. But this is a very general paper, right? This, is, this actually um, speaks to any dimensionality. Now, likewise, because this is symmetric, remember um, uh, this being symmetric, means that uh, these guys are also zero. So all the G, C, ones are zero as well. So we've identified that this guy is always going to be one, and those guys are going to be always uh, G, C, one. And then uh, the last one uh, gives us a little bit of trouble because the last one is two of these circumstances that we can't simplify much. We can pull out this lambda squared, just like we did uh, here, right? We can pull out the lambda squared, leave behind the two v's, but we can't really focus much on these two v's, right? We don't, we don't have the formulas that relate the, uh, um, the tangent vectors of the geodesics to an, an angular coordinate. So we leave those the way they are, and we compress this whole thing. We solve this whole thing for, uh, we, we basically imply that this whole sum, it's going to be some new tensor, and uh, we're going to call that HCD, right? So HCD, but CD is a, is actually a three by three uh, tensor, right? Uh, because C and D only go from the numbers two, three, and four. So CD really needs to be. So I would say CD needs to be two, three, and four, right? Those those numbers. Um, to be consistent with sort of how this seems to be designed. But it's still a three by three square matrix with a lambda squared leading factor. And that lambda squared being a leading factor is important because lambda ultimately we're gonna take lambda to zero, right? So the new matrix, the new metric matrix in this system has this nice structure, and I'll, I'll try to just do zero, 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 and then it's going to be, um, lambda squared h11 one, one, and the last one will be oops sorry not 11 one, one, h22 two, two, right uh let me blow this up so i can actually do it um this will be lambda squared h22 two, two, lambda squared h23 lambda squared h24 and so on, like this, okay? So th so we've actually, this process that we've gone through, evidently this was our goal. Our goal was to sort of cut this matrix back into a three-by-three three matrix instead. 
And now, um, and remember, GAB was arbitrary, right? This was arbitrary. This didn't have any special structure. But by forcing these uh, coordinates to be such that they are, by using Riemann normal coordinates, we've kind of beaten it back into this uh, structure where we know that we've got a bunch of zeros and a one. So we've kind of jammed all the interesting stuff into, um, into the middle. And what we might be even tempted to do, although I don't think they actually ever do this, you might want to call that one over lambda squared and pull the lambda squared out, right? But, um, uh, but that's not what they do. That's not what they do. They leave it this way. Okay, so that's pretty good. So we've now created this matrix GAB. By the way, um, I just said using Riemann normal coordinates, we've gotten into this mode. But then again, haven't we just done a coordinate transformation? I mean, this was Riemann normal coordinates. What about this new thing we've done? Well, remember, the, remember that the thetas are still a way of defining the position of the tangent vector to the geodesic. So it doesn't matter how we identify the position of the tangent vector. The fact is, is that we're still going a distance lambda along a geodesic, and it's the way we characterize the tangent vector that's changed. We used to trans characterize it with v these Vs, these orthonormal Vs, and now we're characterizing it with these angular variables um, to identify its direction, and then lambda, the distance along it. So it's still very much uh, in the spirit of Riemann normal coordinates, though, though literally when we talk about Riemann normal coordinates, it's almost always done using this formulation. Okay, so what do they do next? Well, fortunately, the next stuff is not very difficult. The first thing they do is they just find the inverse, right? G, A, B. Remember, for any metric, um, G, well, the, the, when, when they go to the covariant components for the metric, it's basically the inverse, right? So, well, they're finding the covariant components of this thing, and that's not hard to do. It's just sort of a symbolic exercise. So this is the, I'm sorry, they're finding the contravariant components. Here we got the covariant version, right? Here we're figuring out the contravariant version. So they do the contravariant version, and uh, that's what this is up here. So then, um, then, now that they've got this new metric in this, they've got the contravariant version very easily figured out in the new coordinate system, right? But they want the contravariant version of the metric in the old coordinate system. And remember, this is all with foresight. So they're just doing these calculations. And these are very rote calculations now. This is all just using your basic transformation law for a metric. And here, um, normally they would write this out. What, what would be the formula for this? What would be the formula for um, the, uh, this is the metric, the contravariant components of the metric in the old system given the components in the new system? Well, normally you would write it this way. Normally, you would write it like this. You would say this is the new, this is the uh, metric in the new system, or metric in the old system, metric in the new system, and this is the transformation for the uh, uh, contravariant parts. Now, notice this transform. So now, but down here, I have theta C and D, and I'm thinking that C goes from C equals 1, 2, 3, and 4, but I'm saying that theta zero is going to be lambda, right? So that's how that's how this language would have to be compressed to be a single term. But they already know, right? They already know that all terms involving g g um, one c are equal to zero. So they basically take this sum, they blow it all up, right? They extract the one one piece. They eliminate all of these pieces, and then they recompress the i, j pieces where i and j go 2, 3, and 4, like that, right? So that's what they've done there. So it's just an application of this very elementary uh, coordinate transformation from the new coordinates back to the old coordinates. And the reason the transformation, by the way, is the same, right? It's x, a, x, theta, c. If you go back here, it's the same... As, as this, but remember, this was the covariant transformation from the old coordinates to the new, 
which is turns out that that's the same as the contravariant transformation from the new coordinates to the old, right? So that's why it looks so similar. And those kind of things can confuse the heck out of you until you sit down and realize, okay, wait a minute. Okay, I got this right. It's, it's new to old, old to new, covariant, contravariant. And once you settle on it all, it becomes very trivial. Okay, so they work through this and they come up with the exact same process. We know what these derivatives are. It's VA, VB. We know that we can pull a lambda out of each of these. We get that lambda squared. We're left behind with those two things. And um, GIJ, right? This is where the, all the work kind of sort of simplifies things a little bit, right? The, um, this GIJ, that literally equals HIJ, right? That was a literal translation, uh, HIJ. Now, one thing that does kind of bother me a little bit here and I don't know if it's an error or if it's something that's going to... Sometimes I'll say, oh, this paper made a mistake, and then I'll realize later, oh, geez, I'm an idiot. You know, they've worked hard on this, and I miss, 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 and I, and I got it wrong. You don't see those because I, I, don't, I don't show them to you, right? But if you look at this, what about G11? Well, G11 is supposed to equal 1, right? That's, well, at least G11 equals 1 for sure, right? That's what it says right here. But if you look at this, G11 should in principle be equal to H11, right? So I, I have a feeling that what this is where this 2, 3, 4 versus 1, 2, 3, 4 business becomes a problem, right? Um, you know, uh, the, the way they probably this may have had to have been was G, A, B, and then H would have had to be I, J, right? And um, uh, I, J just goes from uh, 2, 3, and 4. So I think there's a notation complication there that I don't fully understand. But you'll notice that here it's not a problem because they use I, J there, and it's pretty clear because down here, your thetas are distinguished from your lambdas. And we know that theta i um, is going to be going uh, 2, 3, and 4. So here it's okay. It's just here that it's a little bit of a, uh, a mess, as far as I can tell. Um, so it's still true, right? G, A, B, the, the contravariant parts of the old metric are given by this two ve this this uh, tensor product of these two vectors these two derivatives um, contracted into h i j now notice this contraction there's only this is a three index contraction right you only contract for two three and four so this contraction is a little bit smaller than our normal contraction but a and b those go from one two three and four so this is still uh, four by four uh, uh, object, right? Even though H is just a three by three object, the fact is you've got all these extra, um, you've got one extra index value uh, up in the top. All right, so um, uh, what do they do next? Well, the next thing they do is uh, they just rearrange this, right? They just rearrange it because they want this term. That's what they're after, right? That's what their foresight is leading to, is they want to use that term a little later. They, they're obviously somewhere down the road, this is going to show up, and they want to substitute for that. So that's what to keep an eye on for. And so in the end, uh, we're going to probably stop for today around here. But remember, this is the guy we're trying to figure out the determinant of. We're trying to figure out the determinant of the pullback of the metric so we're trying to figure out the pullback of the metric on s on the space sn minus 1. And gij, there's, remember, sn minus 1 is one dimension less. So i and j should have um, uh, one index uh, uh, increment less than, than, than the increments on, on uh, gab, right? And that's exactly the case, right? i, I goes from one to, uh, no, wait, I'm sorry. I goes from, we're calling it two, three, and four. We probably want to renumber that, right? So uh, so now, okay, so let's, let's call this out. 
Remember where we got these thetas. These thetas were the coordinate system on S n minus 1, right? Those thetas were the coordinate system on S n minus 1. So it's it would be inane to call them anything other than theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. We could go 0, 1, and 2, but we don't want it. We're going to just go theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. Now we've got another coordinate system now that is on... Um, M that went lambda uh, theta 2, theta 3, theta 4, the way I had it written. So we're actually going to change this to lambda theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3, right? This is just We're just going to renumber it, and we're going to use those three as our coordinate system on Sn minus 1. So now the point is, is we finally got to that place where we use the fact that our Riemann normal coordinates written in this form define a very nice coordinate system on the submanifold. So when we look at this expression that we worked so hard to get for the pullback of the metric, these thetas here, right, are really the same thetas that we've been wrestling with here on this coordinate transformation. It's the same set of thetas. This is a very subtle point in this paper, I think. I mean, um, uh, what the, certainly the first time I read this paper, I was like, wait a minute, what the, what the heck? Why are these thetas suddenly the same? And they don't really overtly say that at this point we're making these a coordinate change to a system which also is a system on Sn minus 1. But that is what's happening. And so now when we see the when we go back to our first work, the first like 10 lectures, those thetas that we presume were on Sn minus 1 are the same thetas we're dealing with now. So we can we're, there's only one set of thetas. And what this this was actually the formula that we derived, right? This piece right here, right? That's what they're going to replace with h's. And notice this is 3 by 3, right? Because there's only 3 Remember, theta was a coordinate system on Sn minus 1, even in the original time. There's only three coordinates there, or one less than in M, right, if you're using the fully general manifold idea. But if in special relativity, M would have dimension 4, and Sn minus 1 would have dimension 3. So those, so there's only, uh, I can be any of three values, J can be any of three values, because that's what lands in the subscripts. But these are four-valued, right? Because this is the bigger manifold. So when you sum here, the Bs and the As, you're summing over four things. But everything that has four is summed away. C and D are summed away into the Riemann tensor, and E and B are summed away into the Riemann tensor. So the only thing that's left are these three indices, I and J, which land here. So that's good, because we're expecting this metric to be on a three-dimensional manifold. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take the we're going to take the fact that we've changed bases on this and we're going to swap out for hij and we'll do that in our next lecture. And then we're going to actually go and calculate the determinant of this object. Once we have the determinant, we'll be able to integrate that um, and find the volume of the entire Sn minus 1 manifold as it sits in M. And then we'll be able to compare that with the Euclidean space version and somewhere in all of that mess the scalar has got to show up because that's our goal here. Okay, all right, see you next.